Welcome everybody back after a break. Um, We now begin a new church year, beginning this Sunday on the first Sunday of Advent. And the way that the church prepares us for Christmas is the first two weeks of Advent are all about the second coming of Christ. So instead of just beginning and starting with Old Testament prophecies to the coming of Christ and His birth in Bethlehem, the first thing that the church invites us to do in these two weeks is to meditate on the end times. To think about, am I ready to stand before the Lord at His coming or at my death? And that's why we, we call Advent a mini Lent. That's part of the reason we priests wear purple today. It's, it's a time of repentance. And as Advent means advenite, the turning towards the Lord. When the Lord Himself is coming more directly into our lives, How can I turn from the world and and respond with my own life back to Him? Just in in little ways. So really the question we should be pondering in this Mass is, what's the sacrifice that I should be making this Advent? What's the sacrifice that would help me prepare my heart and soul for, for the meeting with Christ even at my death, but especially to enter more fully into Christmas into His first coming at the end of this season. But this reminded me of a story of St. John of God because I'm doing a novena for someone who's very sick right now, and I'm doing it to St. John of God. And I, he, He's just a man who he has such a chaotic story, a man who wanted to do something great with his life, something great for God, something epic that everyone would hear about, and yet so much of his life was a seemingly failure at that very thing. You know, he grew up, he was born in Portugal, Spain in the end of the 14th century and raised in a devout family, but it was just his parents and him. And at eight years old, we still don't know to this day whether he was abducted or he ran away, but at eight years old, he was taken from his family. And he ended up in Toledo, Spain, where he's homeless, didn't know anybody and didn't even know the way to get back to where he came from. So he lived at eight years old for years on the streets, just wandering. At one point, he was picked up by a a nice man who who had a farm, and so he hired him on to be a shepherd. So for the next like 15 years of his life, he was just shepherding sheep. But he still had these desires to do great things in life, but this was his lot. And at one point, the father asked if he would like to marry his daughter, And his response was running away in the middle of the night. He saw a a band of soldiers walking. It was from the the Spanish army. And so he joined them. Because again, he had these great ideals of what can be my life story? How will I be remembered? That that dream stayed within him. Even those years as a shepherd, being away from family. And so he goes and, and for the next 15 years, he was fighting in the army. But also in that time, he lost his faith little by little. In the same way that we can lose our relationship with God, just getting lost, as Christ says, in the anxieties of daily life, the drunkenness and carousing. That's what happened to him. And so he fell into a life of great debauchery. It was a lot of gambling, drinking, womanizing, and even killing. You know, constantly going to different battle after battle. But he was never finding the answer to that greatness he felt called to in his life. And he never forgot about God. And at one point, he, he felt called, well, he felt moved enough in his mid-30s to go back home, to try to find his childhood home and find his parents again. And when he went back, he found out that uh, his mother had died of heartbreak after he had been taken away. And his father joined a Franciscan order and had died a holy death in a monastery. And the realization of what had happened to them after he left was, was a piercing to his heart. And he had an awakening of that he needed to come back to God to change his life. So he, he, uh, at first, he made a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, the same pilgrim, pilgrimage myself and some of the students did a couple of years ago. He did the full 500-kilometer walk barefoot and just praying for God to reveal himself to him. He got there, he made a confession of his sins, and from there, he, he, just, he left with this idea of, okay, how can I offer myself to God? And so, like, what is God asking of me? 
And he thought, well, there's a lot of Christians in the Muslim areas in Africa who've been enslaved. So I'm going to go down there and I'm going to ransom them by trading my life for theirs. So he gets on a boat, goes all the way to Africa, and is prepared to, to give himself over to servitude to free some other family in need, making this his great gift to the world. And he meets a Capuchin friar on the way who tells him, this is not God's will for you. You need to go back home. God will reveal himself to you in Spain. So he goes back, but he doesn't know where to go. So again, he starts wandering. For just a few years, he's just wandering, walking the roads, asking God, what do you want from my life? And at one point, he's walking and he sees this child in the middle of the road, just walking with bare feet. And he goes to him and he, he picks up the child and he begins walking him to the next town to try to find him to give to someone. But as he was walking, he was getting heavier and heavier until he could no longer hold the child in his arms. He put him down and the child looked at him and said, um, he said, you are John of God and Granada shall be your cross. Granada a small town in Spain. And then the child disappeared. And so with that, he, he went to Granada, Spain, and there's nothing for him to do. So he opened up a Catholic bookstore. Right? He's like, okay, at least maybe I'll spread the faith a little bit this way. But at one point, it was on, actually we know the exact date, January 20th, 1537. He's now 42 years old. Right, All these experiences in life and still does not feel like he's doing what God has asked him to do. And he hears a sermon by John of Avila, who then became St. John of Avila, another, another great preacher, who preached about the end times, preparing ourselves to, to meet God at the end of life and repentance for our sins. And he actually has a mental breakdown. So he starts going from church to church in Granada, confessing his sins publicly, beating himself, and, and telling everybody that Jesus is going to come back soon. So much so that they, they put him in a, a mental institution in an asylum in the local hospital. And in that time, what they thought that the best way to treat uh, mental uh, infirmities like that was uh, insanity was to was be cured by physical duress. And so a lot of physical sufferings to like wake them up out of it. I try it with the Frasati boys all the time. It hasn't worked yet, but um, there, there's some good fruits. And so what they did is they put him in solitary confinement underneath the hospital, chained to the floor. He was uh, flogged. He was um, starved for a lot of the time. And at one point, John of Avila came to see him 40 days later while he's in the hospital. And he says to him, he asks him why he was doing what he was doing, and he, he says, we need to repent of our sins. Jesus is going to return. We need to be ready. And John of Avila says to him, this is not God's will for your life. You need to stop thinking about the end times, and you need to stop thinking so much about your own sins. How can you care for the people right in front of you? What's a problem in front of you that, you, that God could use you as an instrument to fix. Well, he's just been living in this hospital for over a month and seen all the ill treatment of all these patients. He said, I, I, think, I think there's some people I can help here. And so he ended up, John of Avila got him out of the hospital. He came back the next day as a volunteer. And so he started serving all of the patients in the hospitals, and all the sick people in the towns. And he did it with such love and compassion and gentleness that all of a sudden, all the sick were coming to him. And he'd spend his days caring for them. And at nighttime, he would go and collect money anywhere he could find it to then get medicine or food to serve them. And then other people started to see what he was doing. He ended up starting a religious order in that very town of Granada that still persists to this day with brothers who serve in hospitals. And yet he, he just gave himself completely to all these people who were so neglected right in this town. And what I, what I find so beautiful about his life is, I mean, just look at He was abducted as a child. He was homeless, 
He was a shepherd for years, a soldier, a sailor, a wanderer, a visionary, a Catholic bookstore seller, a lunatic in an insane asylum. And then at the ripe age of 42 years old, he finally discovers God's purpose for his life. And it was right there in front of him in this very hospital where he found himself. And because he gave himself right there in the midst of his circumstances, serving those in front of him, he's forever remembered as St. John of God, the man who loved the poor and the sick, and who started a whole new religious order for that very end. And the last thing he ever did in his life, like he was a very impulsive man, if you haven't realized yet. And uh, he was already sick, old age, 55 years old, and they were getting wood out of, a, out of a river, and one of his companions fell in the river. Without thinking twice, he just jumped in and grabbed him, and they got his friend out, but he was harder to get out. He ended up catching pneumonia and died a few days later. But like for every single moment of his life to the end, he was just asking, what does God want from me right here and right now? And he made the mistake at the beginning of trying to go to all these different places with all these great dreams of what his life could be and should be. And yet all along, his great calling was right in front of him in, in this deprivation in these hospitals. Right in front of him. And we could do the same thing, I think, in our own lives. If we have too big of a vision of where we want to be or who we want to be before we make great sacrifices in our life, it can blind us to the very small things right in front of us that's in our control to make better. You know, St. Paul, and it's, it's interesting that the church brings this reading up for Advent, because St. Paul, when he's talking about the end times and how we prepare ourselves, he says, brothers and sisters, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, so as to strengthen your hearts. That abounding in love for one another strengthens our hearts. To be blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That there's a, a grace and a strength that we receive when we love those right in front of us that makes us strong to stand steadfast for the coming of the Lord. So in Advent, we're, we're asking the question, what is the sacrifice I should be making in this time? And one I think that every one of us is definitely called to is more silence. Advent is a time of greater silence and stillness so that we can speak to the Lord. And when we speak to the Lord, what I invite you to really ask is, who is it in my life I need to be reconciled with? Because we all know holidays, it's the beautiful thing is we're around a lot of family and friends again, but it's also the very the, the cross that we have to be the bear at times being around family and friends for extended period of time. So like who even in front of me in my own family or in my community or at my work or in my school, whatever it might be, that's in front of me where there's broken relationships or where I fail to love them as I know that Christ would be calling me to. As we go back, as we're preparing for these holidays at Christmas, really think about what are the relationships that Christ wants to reconcile in your own life? And can you be the instrument for that? And the temptation, I think, is that we, we get stuck in a narrative that that's not big enough. That's not really going to change things in my life. Or that this other person isn't going to change even if I step out and offer a hand. That, that's, a, that's one of the great, beautiful things about John of God and so many of the saints is that if we just learn to love what is in front of us, the people in front of us, the situation in front of us, to let our hearts overflow and abound in this situation right now,
not only does it bless them, it strengthens us and it prepares us for the coming of our Savior at Christmas.